Good evening, friends. Ian Andrews here from Lakewood Alive. Thanks for joining us tonight for Knowing Your Home, Safe at Home. We're really pleased that you're here, uh, here with us tonight. We've got some fantastic folks joining us uh, from Maximum Accessible Housing of Ohio. So we're going to wait for just a little bit to welcome folks into the room, uh, and I'll be back with you in just a moment. Hi everyone, Ian Andrews here with Lakewood Alive. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really pleased that you're here. Uh, we're just gonna give it a, maybe about another minute or so uh, to wait for a few more folks to join us and then we will get started here shortly. So I'll be back with you in just a moment. Okay, hi everyone, Ian Andrews here with Lakewood Alive. We're excited to get started. Thanks for joining us for the uh, latest in the Knowing Your Home workshop series. We're really thrilled that you're here. Uh, we have such incredible homes in Lakewood and so to be able to understand how to uh, maintain them and uh, we all love them and sometimes they certainly can be a labor of love, but gosh, they're great homes. We're really glad that you can learn uh, from this workshop series. We're really thrilled to have sponsors uh, a sponsorship and support from the City of Lakewood, Cleveland Lumber Company, First Federal Lakewood, and Lakewood Public Library. Uh, and just really happy to have our friends and partners from Maximum Accessible Housing of Ohio joining us. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to our Housing and Internal Operations Director, Allison Urbanic. Allison, take it away. You are muted still. Okay. So now I'm not, see that you, I was making sure you were paying attention. So you passed, great job. Um, it's just tricky thing, Zoom has this line through the bottom that it just seems backwards. So um, thanks, thanks for turning it over. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is our, oh, third workshop, I think, through Knowing Your Home, our workshop series. And it is just, you know, we've hit the ground running and it's fantastic um, to be able to bring these workshops to you virtually. We wish we were all together, but this seems like a nice secondary way to come to you. So um, the nice thing is that this is being recorded. So we'll be able to watch it again in the future to really digest all the information that's being shared with us today. So I'm very excited to be able to bring you Beth Glass and Mara Lane from uh, Maximum Accessible Housing of Ohio. They are great partners with the organization. And we are hosting a workshop for the first time called Safe at Home. Um, it'll be very exciting to learn tips and tricks, how to maximize our safety at home, reducing trip hazards, as well as um, different safety features that are available um, and will make people feel safer in their surroundings. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beth. Uh, welcome, and we look forward to learning from you uh, this evening. Oh, one last thing. We are taking questions, but they will be after each segment. So feel free to put them in the Q&A. You'll see that at the bottom, uh, and we will read them and make sure we get them answered. And if we don't have the answers, we'll make sure we get that information to you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beth, and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Allison and Ian and Like Little Live and all of you for joining us tonight. I'm going to get this started. Okay, so Mara and I are from Maximum Accessible Housing of Ohio. We're a nonprofit that advances accessibility, independence, and inclusion in homes and communities. 
our organization's been doing this for 40 years. This is our 40th anniversary year. We own and operate fully accessible housing for people with mobility disabilities in Northeast Ohio. Through that, we've learned a lot about home safety, home accessibility, and community uh, inclusion. And we share everything we've learned about accessibility with other people like you. So you can make your own homes safer and more accessible. And um, that's through our Anderson Center for Accessible Living program. So tonight we're gonna be talking about uh, home safety. And as Alvin mentioned, we're gonna do it in three different segments, uh, security, false prevention and emergencies. So looking at different things that we can do to make our homes safer. Um, a lot of it is talking about home accessibility because when we make our homes um, safer for people with disabilities, making them accessible, we increase home safety for everyone in the home. Um, so it is really important to think about, uh, especially in terms of like falls prevention. Um, everybody can fall or slip in the home, um, particularly in the bathroom, which is where most home falls occur. So we'll be talking about um, some really good, easy, easy to achieve strategies throughout our homes. Okay, so first, home security, uh, just the basics here. And the first thing is thinking about your lighting, your exterior lighting. Um, you really wanna make sure that all of your entrances to your home have strong lighting. Consider motion sensor or light sensors on your fixtures. That's also helpful, especially if you have anyone in your home who has had any hearing loss. Um, having the motion sensor lights outside um, provides a visual alert to a person being outside the home, which they might not be able to hear. Um, so that is really helpful. Uh, we do have, we're just using uh, PowerPoint's captions down here, which is a newer feature. So if there's anything really odd that comes up in that captioning, um, it wasn't me. Okay, so near all entrances to the home, uh, especially for nighttime. There's so many motion sensor lights available now, as well as um, light sensors, which are sensitive to um, the light and darkness uh, around the home. When it comes to the entrances of your home, it's really important to have a viewing panel, windows, or peepholes at appropriate heights so that everyone in the home can see who's outside. Again, that's especially helpful um, if you do have any vulnerable populations inside the home or you know, make sure to consider children as well so kids can see who's there, um, making sure they're not letting in strangers. Um, so here we have one example with nice big clear windows. Uh, and here we have an apartment door with peepholes. You can see we have one raised up high and there's also one down low. Um, you can install additional peepholes on your door very easily. There are peephole kits that are as inexpensive as about 40 to $50 at the hardware store. Um, you can also get peepholes that have a larger viewing screen um, if getting close to the peephole is too difficult. Um, it's really helpful to think about um, adding a peephole as well on interior garage doors. So if somebody were to break into your garage or if you left the garage door open, um, having a peephole on that interior garage door like to your kitchen, um, that would allow you to see what's happening inside your garage without having to open the door. Typically there's no peepholes, no windows at that situation, which could be really vulnerable for you. Um, so really easy to add a peephole there at a height that works for the people in your family. Oh, also consider um, on your exterior doors, uh, utilizing chain bar locks on those doors to make sure they are safe. Um, and with a deadbolt lock. Um, so again, extra security there. Um, this particular example uses both a key and uh, a keypad uh, to operate that door lock. So multiple options there. Um, yes, and again, make sure um, when you're thinking about things like a chain or a bar lock, again, consider the interior garage doors, which often we kind of forget about because we do have that garage door, the larger garage door. Um, intercoms can also help increase safety. It can be a video intercom, which are a little bit newer technology. Um, there are still audible intercoms that are available. And um, 
Oh, here we have the example of the look. Uh, make sure it is installed properly. And here is just an old school intercom, which you can still get pretty inexpensively, um, that allow you to hear and talk to the person outside your home. Uh, typically, you just exchange your um, present doorbell with an intercom like this. So it's not as fancy as like a ring or a nest video intercom, um, but it does still allow you to speak to the person outside your home. Which brings us to newer uh, security technology. And I'm actually going to throw this over to Mara, who is experimenting with all this and knows so much more than I do. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk about security and technology. Um, we are actually currently updating our demonstration unit, which is not currently available to the public for touring, but during non-COVID times, it absolutely is. Um, and we are updating it with a lot of this new security and technology. And some of that does include video doorbells and intercoms, such as the Ring. We actually just, I actually just opened ours today. We're really excited about using it. Um, we are also experimenting with um, some DIY systems like Simply Safe and Front Point and Full Alarm systems such as ADT and Nest. Um, some benefits of something like the Ring or Nest is they're often not through contract. They are something that you can try out in order to um, see like what level of security might be the most appropriate for you. They're often very low cost. You can get them through Amazon to your door in about two days. Um, I believe that our ring doorbell was around $80, maybe $90. Um, and it doesn't have any contract associated with it. You can stream it right to your phone. So if you're more familiar with using your smartphone, then you would be comfortable with say setting up a two year long contract with like ADT um, because oftentimes those do have about a two year long um, period or window of security contracting that they'll connect you like directly with the police um, in the fire system in your area. Um, those will just go straight to your phone and then you can be then responsible for making the decisions that are necessary for your safety rather than having a company make those decisions for you. Um, and there's also a lot of really, really cool um, new things happening for medical alerts. So not only can your um, ring doorbell connect and your Nest connect to say something like your Alexa or your Google Home, um, but you could also have smart technology be your friend in the medical area. So something that would include um, like your smartwatch. Smartwatches often include features that you can connect to your smartphone um, or to a friend's smartphone if say you don't have one, um, such as a fall alert. So if suddenly your smartwatch were to detect an extreme um, impact on the watch, it will assume that you'll have fallen. If you maybe you just smacked your arm or you dropped the watch really hard on the floor, there's often a few seconds of give and take between the smart uh, device that you're wearing and the smarter device that it's sending the alert to. Um, and often also you can pair those up with a trusted friend. So if you're not ready to make the transition towards, um, we've all seen like life alert commercials, the help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Um, how embarrassing and how outdated those can seem. Brand new technology wants to keep you safe in the exact same way. Um, and a lot of time we can do that with trusted friends and family. Things like Find My Friends on Apple's iPhone can be super, super helpful if you want to let your grandkids or your kids know that you're safe at home after a long drive, after, say, a family dinner at the friend's house. Um, this, these smart technologies can be super accessible, really, really affordable. And all they take is a little bit of education, a little bit of knowledge towards um, input, implementing those safety and security devices into your life. And they can become super easy. Thank you, Mara. Um, and I do wanna share that if you um, do wanna go with a more traditional medical alert, life alert, I know that alarm systems such as Simply Safe and um, ADT do offer um, med alert options as well. Um, so you can kind of integrate that and use that whole system. A ring also has uh, a med alert, but it's not quite as um, 
advanced as some of the other ones are. That's right. It used to be a little bit more, um, in the past, it was a little bit more like direct towards um, getting you an emergency service, whereas now there are levels of appropriate service for every ability and every age, which I think is really cool. There's something for super active people who are out running, doing laps, maybe out hiking in the woods who might need help, and people who are at risk for falls in their home. So it's all about the level of help and level of security that you need right now, and that's available now. Uh, okay, so questions, discussion about security. I have a few questions. Um, first off, could you tell us a little bit about the Anderson Center? So I think maybe some folks sure. may not really know too much about the Anderson Center. And I sit on a committee, the program committee, it just changed names. So I'm sorry if that's not the right one. I mean, it did like a year ago, but I still haven't caught up. And uh, I work with the Anderson Center and it is a fantastic, amazing place and cutting edge in terms of technology and aging in place and um, amazing stuff going on there. So if you could talk a little bit about it and is there a way for us to get a tour virtually while you're closed? Sure, so the Anderson Center, we do education and outreach around accessibility. So workshops such as this, uh, next week, actually, Mara is starting a really exciting workshop series on aging in place. Um, one on the outdoors, one on technology. So a whole session just devoted to technology and one on kitchens and bathrooms. Yes. Yes. And uh, so that's really exciting. That's um, every Tuesday for the next three weeks. Uh, you can get more information about our program and those workshops at maxhousing.org our website. Uh, I think it's maxhousing.org slash seminars, I believe will take you directly to our workshop page if you want to register. Um, so workshops like that, we are currently updating our demonstration unit. It's in our university circle office at one of our apartment buildings. It's a fully accessible demonstration space that we're currently renovating to add a lot more new features, things like smart home technology, uh, different kinds of countertops, a really cool four-door refrigerator uh, we just added into, yeah, a four-door refrigerator. It's really neat um, that we just added to the space. And the idea is that we can try things out. You can come visit it and try things out and see how things actually work for you, what you're comfortable with. We have different kinds of flooring materials, different kinds of countertops. I'm excited about those scene. flooring materials. Uh, oh, no. I can't wait to get back over there. It, it's going to be really neat. Um, so right now we're not offering a virtual tour because it's kind of in shambles. Um, but as soon as we have it all put together, we will be first um, doing a virtual tour that we'll be filming. And then we will hopefully by the end of summer be able to start having folks back in in small groups into that space. A lot of the things okay. that we're talking about in this very presentation, you will actually be able to use in that demonstration unit. Just like I said, like the ring, if you want to try it out before buying it, you can come and try it at the demonstration unit. And we can also share, sure. and from this workshop too, um, we will follow up with Allison and Ian, Ian and share um, the different products and things that we've tried out, um, that we've talked about tonight. We'll share those with you guys. And we're happy to discuss too, like why we picked, you know, the Alexa over whatever Google's, what's Google's thing called? Uh, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, it's just home. called the That's Google, Google home. home. Okay. <laughs> um, so why, you know, why we picked what we picked and the research that we did and how it works for us and what all the opportunities are. Um, and don't be intimidated if technology is not your thing. We also do have a whole bunch of low tech options um, lots of different kinds of jar openers and can openers and fun things that you can try out. Um, so we're also at any point happy to talk with you one on one um, about your specific home or if you're looking for solutions to something specific. Um, like if you uh, recently diagnosed with arthritis and you're looking for things to make it easier for you to cook in your kitchen. Um, we can share that with you and talk with you about it and provide some tips and tricks and uh, solutions for you. 
And we're not salespeople. We're not ever trying to sell you any of these products. We have no affiliation with these products at the moment. Um, we're really just sharing them because we found them to be the safe and most effective products and often the most time, most times the most affordable. We're just accessibility nerds. So we, we, we just <laughs> want to talk about it and uh, get you excited about these things too. And it's true. Uh, they really enjoy accessibility. We've talked, I think, for like 30 minutes about a trash can. And I was fully engaged and loved that conversation. So I'm right there with you. So, um, so yeah, so make sure to check out uh, the website with those amazing workshops. So it's technology, nature, or outdoors. And what was the third one? Kitchen and bathrooms. Kitchen and bathroom. Great, great. Okay, so um, as you may or may not know, I don't really do a lot with technology and getting there. Um, but I'm going to ask you a few questions about the smartwatch fall alert. Um, and you had mentioned that we could like have a friend. If I don't have a iPhone or a smartphone, I could get a friend to kind of set that up on the phone for me, right? So that's probably good for a lot of our family members who don't do smart technology, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I'd have Ian. Ian would install the app on his phone for me uh, if, since I don't really like to do technology. So do I need to be near my friend's phone in order for these things to work? Like for it to talk to the phone, does it need to be nearby? So it completely depends on the program that you're trying to use. If you are not a smart tech user, but your basic phone is Bluetooth enabled, which almost all um, what people call like basic phones or dumb phones, the opposite of smartphones, what we all used to have in the early 2000s, 2010s, um, and a lot of people still have now. Um, a lot of those are actually Bluetooth enabled, even if you're not using them with Bluetooth, Bluetooth devices, which means you can set them up with something like an Apple Watch or a Garmin watch, a Fitbit, something that uses um, Bluetooth to track location, to send notifications like text messages, and yes, even things like falls. There are a few products. Um, I'm not gonna name them right now because I'm not totally sure about the reviews yet, but I will um, include them in our technology seminar later just because I wanna make sure that I can vet these for everybody um, before I share their names, but, there are a few products that are geared towards older adults that don't need to be enabled by a smartphone that's near you. So if you're using something to like say count your steps and you're not worried about inputting that into an app, um, but you do wanna have your notifications synced up with your phone, it's often advisable that you have at least a flip phone nearby um, that it can send those texts to via Bluetooth. Otherwise, if you're using it and you just want to link your location up to somebody else's app to their smartphone, they should still be able to track you even if you're not nearby. Um, so something, Great. if you have maybe like a wandering relative and you want to keep an eye on them, having a smartwatch is not a bad idea. Great. Okay, so if we can move on to ring technology here for just a moment. Um, so the package that we have here in front of us looks pretty expansive, looks like it does a lot. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how it works? So is it recording all of the time? Is it only recording? A set? Like, tell me how a ring camera phone system works. Absolutely. So a ring camera first and foremost is both a doorbell and a camera that can connect to a smart device. So again, if you don't have a smart phone, but you have maybe an Echo Show, something with a screen, you can ask Alexa to show me my front door. And Alexa will use the camera that is on the doorbell that you have installed at your front door to show you anybody that is out in front of your door. Um, it can also tell you if somebody is there using motion si sensor technology, which sometimes has funny mishaps, like say a bug will land on the camera or um, maybe somebody delivers a package and just walks away or a neighbor comes and rings the doorbell. Like you don't always, it's not always, you know, about super security, but it's nice to know if somebody has visited your home and you can place it at multiple places at your home, as many entrances as you have. I'm sorry to hear a little bit of traffic outside of my window here. Um, so it is a, at its very core in essence, a doorbell with a camera. Now that being said, you can record the things that are going on. So there is a subscription you can subscribe to through Amazon 
which will record up to 30 days of like filming outside of your front door. A lot of people do choose to opt into that. I believe it's about $30 a month or I think only $90 a year. So you get a pretty hefty discount if you sign up for the year and it'll record for 30 days and then it'll go through and one by one delete each day. Um, so you'll always have about 30 days of backlogged um, footage. So that can be really good if you're maybe in a higher crime area, maybe you thought a package was delivered five days ago and you didn't realize it had shown up and maybe somebody took it. You can always go back and check that. Otherwise, it's not going to record very long passage of time, maybe at max an hour or two on your phone or your smart device. Um, and the reason that is, is because um, it would otherwise take up a lot of memory and a lot of space on your smart device. It also comes with, you'll see, it's like a little white box in the middle of that photo there, if you can see that. Um, it also comes with a speaker that also has a flashing light. So it'll actually ring like a doorbell in your home. It's not just an alert that you'll get on your phone. You can also use it as a regular doorbell. Um, and it'll alert you with a light to say somebody is here. So maybe you have your ear pods in or you have music going, you didn't hear the doorbell. There's also a visual indicator as well. Well, that's great. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. Um, Ian, any questions before we move on? Okay, great. I think we can move on. All right. Okay, so now we're talking about falls prevention. Uh, and again, this is for the whole family because any one of us can trip or slip or bump in to something and fall um, outside or inside the home. So we're gonna start um, pretty basic, um, but handrails. So making sure that we're thinking about handrails on both sides of the stairwell, the steps and the ramp. Um, ideally, your handrail would be in a contrasting color. These examples are all uh, white handrails on white uh, railings here. Um, you really do want some color contrast so it's easier to see at night. And that handrail is also much easier to grasp than this top um, like chair rail, stair rail that you have up here. This is much harder for your hand to hold on to. It's a little bit too high for children to grasp. So having this lower handrail um, that's easier to hold on to, you can get a good grip on that, that is um, much safer and easier for everyone in your family to use. Um, along with our handrails, again, we want to be easier to grip. Um, and then think about if you have a situation like here, these homeowners have a grab bar installed here, um, right at the top of their steps. So you can orient yourself when you get up there. Um, adding in a grab bar is also a really great option if you have a situation like a sunken living room, or maybe just one or two steps to get into your back door or into your garage. Um, being able to get support there is really essential. You don't have to have a full handrail but maybe just a grab bar addition there would be inexpensive, you know, $15, $20 and a pretty easy install of that grab bar. And preferably again, a contrasting color. Here we have a little bit more color contrast here. Um, another place to think about handrails, uh, if you do have someone in your home who might be prone to balance issues, but isn't quite ready for something like um, a walker or crutches, thinking about installing some handrails along the hallway of your home if you have any longer hallways. Um, it's much preferable for someone to use a properly installed handrail than to lean on furniture. Um, for a while, my um, grandmother was what uh, physical therapists call a furniture walker. Uh, it's not as cool as it sounds. She would just lean on the chairs along her dining room table as she walked. Um, to her kitchen and those chairs did, could not support her weight. So she was slipping and falling quite a bit. Um, so don't be a furniture walker. I know it sounds cool. It's very dangerous. Throughout our home, um, outside and inside, we're looking for low thresholds. Coming into the home, you want that threshold to be no more than a half an inch, preferably beveled. You see we have some soft sides here uh, if that's not uh, an option for like a sliding door, you can do a wedge or a small ramp to help you have a nice beveled uh, increase in slope up to the other side of that threshold. 
So here we have this little wedge ramp along um, a sliding door. So we can easily get up there and not trip. Sliding doors have really difficult thresholds. Um, so this is a nice solution to it. Inside the home, we want that threshold to be no more than a quarter inch high. And again, beveled so it's soft and gentle. There's no big bumps for us to stub our toes on or trip on. Um, and we prefer rubber. Uh, it um, gives you more traction. And the metal ones are just they stick up. They come up over time. They're cold on your feet. There's screws involved. It's a disaster. And I say that to someone who has a metal strip, like five feet away from me that I'm constantly having to hammer the nails, the screws back in uh, because they hurt my feet. Wide pathways are the way to go. Um, at least 36 inch wide, 42 inches are better. Um, here we have an inside example. We'd have a little bit more space without the super cute cat here. Um, but that super cute cat, it's another reason to make sure we have wide travel paths so that we have space to move without bumping into things or tripping on them. Even non-slip surfaces are really helpful. Here we have a low pile carpet that's adhered directly to the ground. Um, one thing about this hallway that's of note too is these are just blank walls. We don't have big portraits or pictures sticking out. Um, no mirrors, which would be really distracting in this hallway. Um, no planters or benches for us to trip into and fall over or bump our heads on. Coming into this home again, we have a nice wide pathway here. Um, I want to point out there's we don't have a lot of landscaping. Uh, we do have a little bit of weeds that start to come over. So make sure that you do keep your travel paths into your home free of any landscaping barriers. So that could be bushes that grow over the sidewalk, um, or it could be a low hanging tree with branches that might hit taller people in the face. Uh, happens to me quite often. Um, it's just something that we don't often think about, but those branches, oh, you guys are all nodding your heads. Yeah, we've all been there. Um, now that the leaves are coming back, I've had some fun, uh, some fun close time with leaves lately. So make sure to keep those travel path safe and clear um, so that we don't trip and fall and hurt ourselves or get branches in our faces. Um, one thing I like about this pathway too, is you can see on the edges, the sidewalk curls up. So you're less likely to roll a stroller or a walker off of that sidewalk, you're gonna stay put. I think that's really nice, a nice feature there. Uh, again, no barriers. So here you can see um, what I like about this is there's no like end table that you can bump your shins on. It's just open, no cords in the way, no excess furniture, nothing to really um, get hurt by. I was just noticing they did a really good job with the cords on this TV. It just looks like it was photoshopped onto that picture, which it wasn't, uh, at least not by me. Um, here again, same thing with this open living space here. I can completely see myself bumping my shins on this fireplace. Um, the good news is that we have lots of room to maneuver around it um, and shouldn't have to get so close to that space there. Uh, Mara and I are big proponents of no rugs. Um, we love kitchens like this, um, and you can see here, um, they have a little bit of rugs here, um, but we prefer no rugs um, because they are so easy to trip over and slide over. I think that might be the next slide. Yeah, so if you do um, enjoy having rugs in your home, make sure they have the non-slip backing all the way to the edges. Um, sometimes, especially bathroom rugs, um, they have like a nice, like, fringe or like um, binding along the outsides. And that rubber doesn't extend to that binding. So those slip up, they curl up over time, which is a new thing for your feet to trip over and slip on. Um, so make sure that if you do go with a rug, that you have that good backing on it. Um, you can also experiment with different things like the non-slip mats that you can get um, to try those out and see if those work for you. 
uh, in your shower or bathtub floor. Um, you can add a non-slip coating to that. Um, it's just called non-slip coating. It's the same material that people use on their boat decks. Gives you kind of a matte finish to your surface and um, allows you to have that non-slip situation in your bathtub without having the uh, old school seashell stickers. Uh, and you guys, yeah, so um, same thing, but um, you can also apply that on most tile floors as well. So like in this bathroom, we could apply that over here by the bathtub um, if we wanted to. Some more examples here. Uh, make sure to consider as well, easy to clean flooring materials. Um, like here where we have, like this is nice big tiles. Likewise here, smaller tiles would be harder to clean. Um, more grout and more um, tiles can pop up. Um, so just keep in mind that it should be easy to clean and maintain over time. Okay, and then a little bit more on lighting throughout the home. Um, here exterior, we have solar lights coming up here. Um, and if this ramp looks a little steep to you, yes, he should add some handrails uh, to this ramp. Um, but the lighting, I like the solar lighting he has here. At night, it really provides a clear pathway up into that home. Um, make sure to have stairwells that are well lit uh, with controls at the top and bottom of the steps. And again, we have some good color contrast here in this stairwell. Um, spaces like the kitchen where you're doing um, very specific technical tasks, um, like using knives, uh, make sure that you have lots of strong lighting. Here we have the task lighting overhead. We have um, lighting coming from outside. We have the overhead lighting. So it's coming from multiple sources. Um, you wanna make sure there's not a lot of glare. And for your task lighting, like here, you want that to be below your eye level um, to make sure that you're not increasing any glare there. Uh, glare is also important in the kitchen. You want to think about your countertops too. Shiny countertops are going to give you more glare. Um, that can make it harder for you to see what's happening. And then um, we're also big fans of night lights. So you can navigate to where you need to go at night without turning lots of lights on or without getting really confident that you can travel without a night light. Um, here we have integrated night lights. They're outlet covers with the nightlight integrated into it. So anytime that it's dark in that room, those nightlights just turn on. Uh, that's a product called Snap Power. Um, that's a good product to, so you always have a nightlight without having a nightlight jutting out from the wall that you have to remember to turn on and off. Um, also consider putting nightlights or um, motion sensor lights uh, in closets. Um, you can also get a special light for your toilet seat. Um, which sounds a little silly. I'm sure you've seen pictures of them before. They look a little silly. Um, but I know several people who've gotten them and they said it's great because when they get up in the middle of the night, the toilet's what they're looking for. Um, so they immediately are easily able to find it without having to turn other lights on uh, in the home. So something to keep in mind. And then similar to handrails, uh, grab bars. So grab bars in the shower um, near bathing areas by the toilet, make sure they're secured to stubs, the studs, not stubs, studs or three quarter inch plywood. Uh, mount grab bars where the people in your home need them. Here we have them mounted kind of in a line all around the home, the bathroom. This is a towel bar. Uh, if you weigh more than a towel, you cannot put your weight on a towel bar. Um, so towel bars are not the same as grab bars. You can use a grab bar for a towel, but not the other way around. Uh, please also do not use suction cup grab bars. They're not going to hold your weight over a long period of time. You can see Allison is shaking her head vehemently. No, don't use that suction cup grab bar. Um, if so, if you have one, put it away. Don't gift it to someone because that makes it their problem. Put it away. Um, and no, install throw it in the trash, bar. Beth. Throw, throw, throw it, it in, in the, the trash. trash. Yeah, you don't even want to donate that. Just don't, don't no, use that don't section. No, don't save it. Rubber. Just put it in the trash. Put it in the trash. 
Thank you, Allison. Um, some other options, we're just going to show you how other people have mounted their grab bars. I like this because we have some color contrast um, with the chrome and the brown tile here. Uh, this grab bar is mounted on the, uh, the bathtub. Um, this is actually in my sister's bathroom. Um, this is her apartment. It, it stayed secure for over a year and a half. And then when she moved to a different apartment, she was able to bring that grab bar with her and uh, use that there. And what's great is in a small, um, a small bathroom, she can use this for both by the toilet and uh, in the bathtub. Um, so that's a really great option. Um, okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, this is a grab bar that um, can be folded up against the wall or come down next to the toilet. And here again, we just have another example of kind of traditional grab bars. Um, there are a lot of grab bar options now. Um, like these ones are pretty fancy. They look really pretty. Um, different colors as well. Um, we also recommend we have uh, a, a product called a grab bar sleeve that we purchased on Amazon. And it's just um, a mildly, mildly abrasive sleeve that you just put over, you zip over the grab bar. And it just gives it some texture so that when your hands are wet, your hands aren't going to slide off that grab it also gives it a color. The one we have is brown, so you put it on a chrome grab bar and then it stands out a little bit. It also has a little bit of cushion, so if you have a harder time grasping things, it's a it adds a little bit of thickness that your hand doesn't have to grasp quite as, as tightly. Absolutely. Um, they have sticker ones as well, but they don't have that thickness that Mara mentioned. Okay, questions about falls? or false prevention, either way. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Um, so I noticed, and this is, your presentation is wonderful and filled with ton of information, tons, tons, tons. In our housing stock here in Lakewood, um, things are a little bit tighter than sure. more of the open concept places. So um, for those of you who are listening from Lakewood, um, I hear you. Uh, we don't have a lot of extra space, <clears throat> so we have to learn to get rid of some extra furniture and um, rugs, removing rugs, of course, because I think we have much of a higher uh, percentage of cramming things into small spaces here. So any thoughts uh, on any tips, tricks, or anything for folks who maybe live in an older home that's more vertical with smaller, tighter rooms? Sure, so definitely uh, evaluate the larger pieces of furniture, um, how often you use them, um, how you use them. Um, those big pieces of furniture can, um, you know, do generally take up most of the floor space. Um, that will make us harder, make it harder for us to navigate and move around. Um, so evaluate what you have in those spaces. Um, I think you could like for for furniture and for storage, thinking about when's the last time you used something and how you used that thing. Um, we have a chair in our living room um, that we literally only use to put throw pillows in when we take them off the couch. Like no one has sat in that chair for years. Um, and I'm constantly pushing it out of the way. My husband's constantly pushing it back. Uh, probably uh, we should just donate that chair. Uh, it's a hazard, we don't use it for anything, um, but it's really, you know, it's colorful, it's pretty. We put the throw pillows on it, it's hard to part with. So I definitely understand um, it's something where you do have to think about, you know, what keeps you safe um, within that space. A great rule of thumb is if you haven't used a piece of furniture or uh, really evaluated or shown off a piece of art or collectibles that in a year, people say either put it in storage or gift it to someone else. Um, really give, give it a new life. These things that you love, such as like our rugs. I have a I have a very dear rug that is just absolutely beaten up. Um, I can't use it anymore. The corners all peel up, but I've had it since I was a child. And so rather than having it on my floor anymore, I'm actually putting it up on my wall as a tapestry. 
Um, and so there are a lot of repurposing of our favorite ornamental rugs um, or lovely pieces of furniture. Oftentimes you'll be even happier to visit in somebody else's home than you would banging your hip into it every time you walk into the door. Um, that being said, there's also lots of unusual um, places to store things. If you're not using your fireplace and your fireplace is deeper, like I know a lot of them in Lakewood are, um, put a grate in front of it and that's a wonderful place to store throw, throw pillows and blankets. Um, utilize your under the couch storage as well as um, evaluate what things you're keeping on your top shelves and never bringing down. If you're keeping that old sauce pot your mother-in-law gave you 20 years ago up on that shelf on that top shelf, but really that's where you should be storing your crock pot, put it up there and give that give that uh, sauce pot a new life somewhere else. Um, all of the things that you're keeping in storage right now are in storage and they're not on display for a reason. Um, think about the things that really could be used in storage because you use them maybe once a year, and the things that you use zero times a year. It's time to say goodbye. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we at Lakewood Alive, um, we talk about Marie Kondo and how oh, you have to love something, give it a big old hug, and then it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you need help getting rid of things, give me a call. I will be happy to help you. Uh, and um, so we do have a question, but I'm going to wait just a moment, Joan. Uh, to get to that question. Um, so I have a question about rugs and non-slip things, right? So my clients, a lot of my clients, they love rugs. And I make them stand on them and try to move them with their feet. And I would say half of the time they move uh, when they're supposed to be staying in place. And all the other time they're in good condition. My opinion is you should just throw out your rug and get a new one. Have you had any luck with finding a non-slip material that you could glue or attach to the bottom? Like, can we reattach new non-slippy stuff to well-loved rugs safely? To permanently attach? Right. So, like, can can we give an old rug a new life by attaching a new non-slippy bottom? So, I read, uh, you know, the internet's full of helpful life hacks, um, and I read one recently that Mara and I talked about, but I don't think either one of us have tried out yet, um, which is um, on the corners to apply a line of hot glue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and allow that to dry. Um, and then that would give you that like sticky surface on the edges there. Um, so that's something, maybe don't try that with your favorite rug. Um, if you try it with your favorite rug um, and it doesn't work, don't call me. Um, but uh, <laughs> you can, if you try it with your favorite rug and it works wonderfully, then please let me know. Um, so, uh, that you could try. Um, most of the things that I've seen for um, adding a non-slip surface have not been permanent. It's been like a non-slip mat that goes underneath and it requires the friction between the two pieces together. Um, but I would agree if that non-slip starts to give um, it, you might want to consider investing in a new, a new rug. Or hanging yeah. it on your wall. Or hanging it on your wall. You'll, you would be surprised by the amount of people who I actually got this idea from. A lot of people have very dear rugs to them. And it and guess what? We live in Northeast Ohio. The walls get cold. <laughs> <laughs> you can serve some of that okay. heat inside. <laughs> Absolutely. That, see, you're, you're very um, forward thinking there, Mara, um, <laughs> in a trendsetter. So, I do want to let folks know, and then I'm going to ask these next two questions, that Lakewood Alive, as well as Mayho, they do aging in place assessments. So um, of the things we're talking about, um, which the next two questions are going to be, I think, specifically related to that, you know, we can come in um, and help assess your living situation and make suggestions of ways to stay safely in your home or to reduce hazards for you 
so you can live there longer. So we encourage you to reach out uh, and it's free. Uh, happy to do that for you. Um, we'll give you an assessment and then Lakewood Alive does have some resources um, and Mayho can talk about if they do as well. We have some dollars that we can help with installing some low hanging fruit or easily accessible items like grab bars um, to help you stay in place longer um, and then give you advice on larger ticket items, best way to approach those. So uh, the questions I have is, uh, the first one is how do we safely use a step stool? Yes, so step stool. So um, the key is first to get the right kind of step stool. Um, so you do want to make sure that it has um, really sturdy rubber feet. Uh, rubber feet are crucial, um, preferably um, rubber feet that are put on like a metal frame rather than like an integrated thing. Um, I remember as a kid, we had ones that had just a little rubber piece in the bottom of the step stool and that easily rubbed off and became uneven. So um, you do want nice sturdy rubber feet on all four feet. Um, likewise, the steps should have a nice non-slip tread um, with, um, I always lose my, the proper words when talking about stair treads, but um, some texture to that. Uh, usually it's going to be uh, horizontal lines across it, so you're less likely to slip. Um, when you do use that step stool, um, I recommend um, having like non-slip slippers or shoes on. Um, please do not use step stools with your socks on. Um, bare feet would be better than socks. Um, if you're using like, if you're on that step stool to like hammer something, you should wear um, just in case you drop that hammer uh, on your feet. Um, I love them with a handle. Um, some step stools do have a little bit of a handrail, at the very least a handle at the top. Um, and you don't want to go any higher than maybe like three steps. Um, so you're not going to want that step stool. It's not going to get you all the way up. Like here I have, you can see behind me, I have really high bookshelves. I have a step stool that I keep nearby. It doesn't get me all the way up. Uh, a step stool that high would not be safe. Um, that would just be a ladder. So um, three or four steps up on that step stool. Um, generally something collapsible um, that you can easily stow away. My step stool is on the other side of that door behind me. Um, and then I can just pull it out. Um, the top handle does have a nice grip on it as well. So it's really about making sure you have the right step stool. And then when you do use that, make sure all four feet are level, that they're all on the same type of surface. So if you want to use it in between the kitchen and the hallway and one's carpeted and one's tile, it's probably going to be uneven and unsafe. I want to add one thing to that, which is I would really recommend getting a step stool with steps that lock, have a locking mechanism. So when it's locked, it won't slide back without releasing that mechanism purposefully. Um, and always making sure that that is locked before you take that first step on there, really testing it by putting hands on it. And a rule of a, of, um, sorry, balance is three points of contact. That means you always want to have two feet on the steps and one hand either on a counter, a wall beside you or on the handrail. So you should never be using two hands when you're up high. You should always have one hand that is connected. Three points of contact will be your most stable position when you're up high. Thank you, Mara. Great, fantastic. So the next question we have is, where would a grab bar be installed at my side door leading to my driveway? Okay, so I would put that grab bar, um, you would want that on the outside, um, on the opposite side of the handle, so that if you were climbing up, you go up your two steps, you're holding onto your grab bar, and then you still have a free hand to unlock your door, um, provided that you don't have like a really nice landing up there. Um, so I would put it on that side. I would make it um, pretty long. That way you can grab that for support when you're down before you go up your two steps and still be using that when you get up to your top step. So a longer grab bar um, next to the door on the opposite side of the handle would be my recommendation. Uh, again, I would recommend a contrasting color. 
Um, I have a, we have a board member who I visited her home and she has the grab bar installed next to the door. Um, I did not take a picture at the time because it was an overcast day. Her house is painted gray and her grab bar was painted gray. So you couldn't tell in the picture that that's what the picture was taken of. Um, so make sure that you do also have a little bit of color contrast there as well. Not just so I can take a picture of it, but so it's easier for you to see and find when you need it. Although feel free yeah, if you yeah. do install it to send us a picture if you'd like. We'd love to have it and include it in one of our presentations. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so then I have one more question to ask. Um, we do a lot of recommendations for the stander bar. So a grab bar that uses a tension rod uh, that locks into place. Um, and we use it often in places that you don't have the opportunity to drill holes for a grab bar or maybe next to a bed where there's not a wall. So there's nowhere to really put a grab bar. Um, how, what are your thoughts on that stander bar? And is that something that you recommend? Yes, uh, I we love the standard bar, uh, vertical grab bar. Um, they are fantastic because they do just use that tension from the floor to the ceiling. You don't have to um, permanently install that. Um, it's a really great option, like you said, Allison, next to the bed. Um, another option next to the bed that people often use um, is the grab bar that goes under the mattress. Um, and I prefer the standard bar because it provides more secure support um, where the ones that go under the mattress, um, it gets a little, it relies upon the stability of the mattress, um, which could kind of give you a tilting situation. They do have ones like that that have feet, um, but it's very difficult to get it level. Um, it really depends on um, how high up your bed is. And so those feet um, generally, um, can become an issue if you're not, like if you don't have like a perfectly standard issue mattress. Um, there are a lot of other similar options um, in the bathroom too that are that don't require any insulation on the walls. So you can get safety rails um, for the toilet. So the safety rails then they actually install on the toilet underneath the toilet seat. Um, so you're not having to drill into the wall. Um, it's a really great option for renters. Um, I don't think there's a lot of um, trailers in Lakewood, but it's a really great option too for like a trailer or a mobile home um, where you don't have really secure uh, walls and studs there. Um, but likewise, that a bathtub grab bar is a great option too for renters um, and for folks who don't want to have that permanent on their wall. I like to suggest it to people who tell me they want to use the suction cup grab bar that I refuse to allow any of the clients that I see to use. And I tell them that I'm watching them and if they use it, they better watch out. Um, so the standard bar to me, like I have a tub surround. Um, for those of you who don't know, my dad lives with me. He's 70, just turned 70. And so we don't really have the ability to put in a grab bar in the shower because of the tub surround. It's old, I'm afraid it's gonna crack. So uh, we are in the process taking a little bit of coaxing, but we are in the process of getting a standard bar. Um, I keep saying I'm going to use it even if he doesn't uh, because everyone needs a little bit of safety when you're getting in and out of the shower. Uh, so I just find it's gonna be great. It's gonna be right outside and then it can actually be used uh, with the toilet as well because it pivots. So super great, super flexible. Uh, and will probably save us some tears in the future. So um, looking forward to that. And I'm glad that you guys feel the same way about it. Um, so and, again, uh, we do offer aging in place. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that reminds me um, one thing um, to make sure that you don't do uh, with your shower and getting into it is don't use the shower curtain for support. Um, your shower curtain, or if you have doors, a glass doors, don't use them. They're not designed to support your weight. Um, they're also not designed to be non-slippery. Um, and there's really a recipe for injury and, and a lot of harm. So definitely follow Allison's lead uh, with that, that standard bar and don't use your shower curtain or your door. 
And guys, I just want to tell you, we just recently upgraded to a um, comfort height toilet in all of our bathrooms. Amazing. Nice. Amazing. Like, I'm loving every moment. I did it for him, but i not going to lie. I love it. That's and then so nice. uh, we also in installed toilet paper holder grab bars. So they are true grab bars, but they hold the toilet paper. And I, again, was like, these are for you. And he's like, I'm never going to use those. And like, I find myself using them. And I'm like, this is great. I've had a bad workout or I did something hurt my back, loving every moment of it. So I'm leaning into all of these things wholeheartedly uh, because they're amazing. You know, I think if we were to um, like put like paint on our hands, like all day, and at the end of the day, see everything that we leaned on without thinking about it, Mm -hmm. we would have handprints everywhere. Um, We don't think about it, but I lean on that counter right next to the toilet. I lean on doorways when I go into a room. Um, I'm sure I lean, we have a table in the living room that I'm sure I lean on sometimes. I do a little furniture walking myself. Um, We all have that stuff. We just don't really think about it. That's what we're doing, but we we do it. And the wisdom in that is too, uh, the earlier you have these things installed in your home, the later you'll actually need them, right? So if you have grab bars around, you won't, you in theory won't have that fall that would cause you to then need to install a grab bar. So um, yeah, that's really nice that now Allison, you'll have those in your home as you age and as you get older and then they'll already be there. And that's so great. I know. So be forward thinking, if you're taking notes throughout this, forward thinking, doing your bathrooms, kitchens, build in those things, you know, it's a universal design concept that we should all be thinking about because we love our homes. We want to stay here as long as we possibly can. Our homes are not necessarily designed for that. So the improvements that we can make will allow us to stay in them a lot longer. So again, please call us. The Aging in Place Assessment, like I said, Lakewood Alive or Mayho can help you with those things um, and we'd be happy to work with you to keep you safe in your homes. So I think we've answered any questions unless Ian, I know you're following along at home if you have any that you want to, I see you taking notes. So I am um, taking notes. Yes, I have, I have uh, two young ones at home and I'm realizing that uh, now I know why the step stool has been sliding because there's nothing on the bottom holding it in. It does lock. Uh, but no tread and no rubber. So basically uh, two strikes on that one. So I'm a terrible parent. So I need to uh, remedy that situation. Uh, no, but I think it's, it's more just an observation of, of trying to put in safeguards, not just for folks who are, who are mature, but also for, for little kids. And the world that we live in, I mean, I can hear them downstairs right now. They just got done with bath time. And when they're getting out of the tub, you know, you got to hold their hand, but the slips and the falls. Uh, there's a lot of situations that we encounter, even tonight, he smacked his head in the corner of the table. So there's a lot of situations that we encounter on a daily basis that I'm, I'm taking a lot away from, uh, from an angle of how to, you know, help the, the children uh, stay safe. So I think this is really just cross-generational and, and very helpful. So thank you. Yeah, there's actually, um, there's actually a horror movie uh, that the premise, it starts around a family having an accident where a kid uh gets injured in the bathtub because there's no grab bar um that's the whole premise of the movie um my husband was watching it and he like yells for me to come in he's like you have to come watch this and just the beginning of the movie it's uh so for kids uh grab bars in the are also helpful yeah Yeah. that scared me enough so i'm not going to tune into that (laughs) uh duly duly noted (laughs) Um, too real too real Right? Yeah, right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, right. it leads it leads to hauntings. Not having a grab bar can lead to lead <laughs> to to uh, hauntings in your home. Okay. Uh, and so now emergencies. Um, so kind of more scary stuff, um, but hopefully some um, interesting and new ideas. Um, there's some fun information here too. So, um, and the first thing is. Uh, I think a really fun uh, thing you can get for your home, um, very serious, but um, a really cool thing most people don't know about, and it's a lock box called a Knox box uh, for your home. So this is a 
secure box that your key is stored in that um, only the fire department has access to. So that if there is an emergency in your home, um, they are able to gain access without having to chop down your front door or otherwise um, have any delay in coming to rescue you and help you. Um, so the way the um, Knox box program works, um, I'll kind of talk you through the whole thing and hopefully that'll help it all make sense. Um, in the city of Lakewood, the way this works is you go to the Knox box website um, and we will make sure to send you guys that link out in the follow-up information. Um, and you select your city. So it's very easy to access this website. I tried it out, Mara and I both tried it out today. I think Allison did as well. Um, so you select your city, it's like for the city of Lakewood, uh, residential, and it gives you um, an option for this product here. And then you simply purchase the product. It costs $170, which I know sounds expensive, um, but again, thinking about the, um, the cost, not just the financial cost, but the practical cost, if there is a delay in them coming to rescue you or having to chop down your door, um, that's a much higher cost than $170 um, for this box. So you order this box, comes to your home, and then you call the fire department and you let the fire department know um, that your Knox box has arrived, they will come and install it for you, um, someone from the fire department, and they have um, a key through Knox box to access that. Uh, and those keys are kept in uh, locked safes on uh, emergency vehicles. So only emergency personnel, fire department, ambulances can access that Knox box and only in the event of necessity. Um, uh, so they will install it, they will keep it, um, they will note that your home has it in their system. So if they're responding to a call at your home, it will come up in their system that you do have the Knox box installed. Um, Allison mentioned to me today, which I hadn't thought of, but this is a fantastic feature, is um, the fire department. Um, so if you are having to be taken away from your home by ambulance, when they leave, the fire department will lock your door for you and then restore that key to the Knox box. So um, that will keep you, your home secure and give you peace of mind while you are um, becoming whole and healthy again. Um, note also, this is just fire department and ambulances and the police department does not have access um, to that. So it's just that emergency personnel coming to help you in the event of um, such an emergency. Um, this is really great for um, seniors, people with disabilities, um, but I do believe it is, in, in Lakewood, it is available to anyone because you are paying that cost. Um, other cities around Ohio do also have this. Um, I know Beachwood has this program, um, other small cities, and I think Cleveland does as well. Uh, if you live in an apartment building, uh, you already have your apartment building most likely already has it. Lakewood does require it. City of Cleveland requires it. So your um, property manager or building owner, they take care of that with the fire department. Um, so if you start kind of paying attention, um, oftentimes these are black. Um, you can kind of see these on apartment buildings and sometimes houses, you see them outside. Um, and that's what that is. That is called a lockbox or a Knox box, which is this particular brand. Um, okay, any questions specific to this? Because I know it's a somewhat confusing concept. Yeah, Ian. So this is uh, fascinating. And I uh, did look while you were speaking and uh, this, I live in the city of Cleveland. I still have a, live in West Park, um, trying to get into Lakewood, which by the way, our houses are equally as small. We had to, we had to remove half of our door frame to get a new refrigerator through. So I, oh, yeah. I yes, we, ha we also have very narrow doors. So anyways, um, as I'm looking, my question to you is, uh, when you, the MSRP is 362 and the price is $170, but the mount type, what kind of a mount type should somebody select if they offer none backplate standard door security door? What kind of direction can you give on the mount type? Uh, oh, Allison, you had some information on that, right? For Lakewood, at least. Yeah. So, 
so you can get a mount if you want, um, or you can get it mount not mounted, but they don't sell. They have a couple other options on the website, like a door, a security door mount and the door mount. And I believe that those are not, Lakewood doesn't want you to buy those. They're not super secure. They want them to be mounted on the actual house. And so I believe they're limiting the styles. So you can really go, you don't go wrong on them. So they're not gonna steer you wrong. Um, and the great thing is, is they'll come out and install it for you. So you don't even have to worry about that. You just call them and they do all the heavy lifting. I would like to have a fireman come out and install a knock box in front of my house. I think that would be nice. So I'm just gonna order one and put it out front and be safe. So I'm very excited about this. I didn't really know much about it and I'm glad Beth brought it up. I actually had a really nice conversation with Fire Marshal Fairbanks and uh, he's fabulous and very thoughtful and walked me through the whole process. Um, and we are actually gonna start looking into how we can subsidize the Knox boxes so that it's not such an upfront higher cost. Um, so, Feel free to reach out to us if cost is a bit prohibitive for you. Uh, in the meantime, while we work to get a program up and running, it might take us a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, so uh, thanks for asking, Ian. You can get the frame, just makes it look a little prettier, I think. Or you can just get the regular mount like this box that Beth has here uh, that they will then um, install it uh, to your house. So you can get the cool border or not and Very good. yeah so yeah this one would just be installed directly like to the wall um on the outside of your home they do have ones that kind of have like a hanger so it'll go over the top of your door kind of like a wreath hanger um i mean it is the same thing as a wreath hanger um but the disadvantage there it is a little bit less secure um because it is just, it's on, it's just hanging on your door. Um, so, and so this is a, a more safe option. Yeah, and I think that um, they're discouraged because if you have a security door and it's locked, I don't know exactly if it hangs on the front, the door, like your actual main door or the screen door. And so if the screen door is locked and they can't get to it, um, it adds a layer of complication. So he, Fire Marshal Fairbanks is really pushing for us to get the ones that get mounted to the actual house. Um, and then they do have reflective tape on them. I think the Max logo as well as the red part there uh, is reflective. So they shine their flashlights on your doors until they see the reflection and run over there to open it up. So really is, cool. I'm so glad you brought it up. Yeah, so cool. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, we're really excited about them too. So, um, and I hope uh, all of you all are able to secure some Knox boxes for your home. Uh, if you have difficulty, if you don't live in Lakewood and are looking for them available in your city and need some help with that, again, reach out to Mara or me and we can help you with that uh, in your city as well. Okay. Um, not as cool, but still important are flashlights. Uh, I know your phone has a flashlight, but uh, that drains the phone battery quite a bit. And you don't always think to bring your phone with you everywhere. And in an emergency situation, there's a lot of things going on and hitting that right button um, can be difficult. Good old flashlights uh, are still really helpful. Um, thinking about putting one on each floor. Um, here we have one that's mounted by a magnet um, next to the breaker box. So in my home, I keep one. I um, actually have a nice one that's not battery operated. It's just um, has a USB charge on it. So I keep, it's a very skinny one that I keep next to my breaker box now. Um, you can attach that with like a, a string. You can hang it up there, a magnet. Um, Velcro or 3M tape would work as well. Um, so thinking about having that flashlight next to your breaker box, I would also, if you have any um, like equipment, like your water tank um, or your breaker box uh, in the basement, um, maybe have a flashlight next to your basement door 
Um, so if the power does go out, you can safely get down those basement steps. Um, so flashlights are still helpful and make sure to um, replace those batteries occasionally to make sure that's healthy and still working. Carbon monoxide and smoke detectors, um, really crucial and important to have um, in your home. Um, make sure to install properly. So carbon monoxide detectors should be on every floor and outside each bedroom. These are installed not on the ceiling, but on the wall five, uh, five feet from the ground. Uh, test these routinely. Uh, smoke detectors install on every floor and inside each bedroom. Um, these are installed on the ceiling four feet from the wall. If you want it wall mounted, it would be four to 12 feet from the ceiling. Um, four feet from the ceiling, uh, not 12 feet from the ceiling. Um, test these also routinely. Um, there are now as well um, combination detectors that are both carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. Um, definitely make sure to look at like consumer reports or wire cutter reviews of anything like that before you purchase it. But technology isn't quite 100% yet on the combination detectors. Um, even the ones that like Consumer Reports recommends, um, they recommend supplementing with an additional detector. Um, so definitely make sure to check those reviews. Um, I believe if you don't have a Consumer Reports like subscription, um, I believe most library systems do have one that you can access. Um, Wirecutter is also another review site um, that's through the New York Times, but you can access those wire cutter reviews for free. Um, so something like this, that's really, really important. Um, definitely check out reviews, make sure you understand what you're looking at. Um, there are a lot of smart detectors now, like uh, Nest. Um, Nest Protect is a really popular one. Uh, First Alert seems to have the best uh, ratings and reviews. Um, and those do have, they have combination ones. They also have old school ones that aren't like wireless. Um, but like the first alert, they do have smart ones that um, work with an app that you can use to control that detector. So you can check its health, check the batteries, check its signal. Um, some of them have like integrated night lights and other features that you can use um, throughout the home. So there are a lot of options available. Um, so definitely, um, do your research, pay attention, and think about what works best for your home and the people who live in it. Um, you can't have, um, you can't be too safe when it comes to um, fire safety. So Beth, if I could just add one thing. Um, yes. So Lakewood Alive um, can come and install smoke detectors for residents. Uh, they're free through the American Red Cross. And then we actually do have a grant uh, that we are able to install carbon monoxide detectors for any senior who needs them. Um, so we can do that. And then also, I just want to add that these devices have lifetimes. So the lifetime for a carbon monoxide detector is seven years. And the lifetime for a smoke detector is 10 years. They have a born on date on them. So, and they have most of the time an expiration date on them. They chirp at like 3 a.m. and that's when they're dying. They don't die at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m. They die at 2 a.m. Um, so it's best for you to stay on top of their expiration dates so that you are not rudely awakened um, by the things that go chirp in the night. Thank you. Um, and definitely, like I know um, my parents had a house that they had the, um, smoke detectors that were all like, they were all hardwired and they talked to each other and they would go off all the time. Um, and so my parents did what so many people do and they took out all the batteries. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, if you're having an issue with your smoke detectors like that, um, maybe reach out to an electrician, see if the fire department will come and take a look at those detectors. Um, and just make sure to get those working. Don't just take out the batteries. Um, so make sure to yeah, keep an eye on that. Absolutely. And the best is to get the 10-year tamper-proof 
So the battery dies when it's no longer um, in good working order. So that's a good reminder to get a new one. So you don't have to worry about changing the batteries every six months. You just want to test it regularly just to make sure it's working. But the 10 year tamper proof will solve all those problems, hopefully, um, and not have to worry about getting up on a ladder and changing batteries and all that stuff. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so uh, a little bit more fire safety, uh, a fire extinguisher. Um, you want an ABC rated fire extinguisher. Um, keep that near your oven or your range, something within easy to reach. Um, you know, you want something that you'll easily be able to spot and something you can easily use. Um, make sure to practice uh, with your fire extinguisher. So if you have an old one, um, don't practice inside, maybe bring it outdoors, practice it, make sure you can use it. Um, I actually, I did not confirm this and maybe Allison, you know, but some fire departments um, do teach you how to use a fire extinguisher and will help you practice with one. I don't know if Lakewood Fire Department does that. I forgot to check on that, um, but we can, do you know, Allison? I, I, based on the fact that they change batteries for our seniors every six months uh, through the senior center, I'm guessing they do. I do not know that for a fact, but I can inquire uh, and if it's any different, so we're going to say yes, the amazing Lakewood Fire Department is going to help you practice with your fire extinguisher. But if they tell me, no, Allison, we do not do that, I will make sure to let everyone know. Um, but I believe that you could call and um, ask them for fire extinguisher safety, and they'd be happy to share that. Excellent. Um, yes, practicing with that is really important. You don't want the first time you use a fire extinguisher to be when there's a fire. Um, adrenaline and things like that. So uh, fire extinguishers. Uh, some other general kitchen safety, um, keep a clear space next to appliances. That's where you can easily access them, but also so you have a place um, to quickly put uh, hot items um, in case you like take something out of the microwave and forget to bring your pot holder with you or if your potholder is thinner than you realize, or you bump your arm on something hot. So making sure that you have a safe space to set things um, and to retreat uh, in the event of injury. Um, with our ranges, we um, really encourage having front controls on that range so that you're not reaching over um, hot implements, boiling water, uh, fire, uh, in order to turn those things off. Having the controls in the front also make it easier to see. Um, so you're not having to see around pots and pans on that range. Um, we love to, do I have an example here? Here we have uh, a mirror. This is uh, our demonstration unit before we started renovating it. Um, we have a mirror here mounted above the range. And um, this allows you to see what's happening inside those pots and pans without having to put your face over those pots and pans. Um, so really helpful uh, for kids who are learning how to cook so they can see what's happening. Again, from a safe space, not having to lean over. Um, I mean, when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, like you just brought a dining chair in and you climbed up it or you like climbed onto the countertop and so dangerous. Uh, we don't have to do that. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, a mirror is a really great solution there. Um, see what's happening uh, on your range. Um, safe access to your upper cabinet step stools. So this step stool actually, um, it does have good feet, but it doesn't have like the handrails that I would recommend. Um, we have actually replaced that step stool with a better one uh, in the demonstration unit here. Um, so maybe for like a closet, I would keep that, um, but I wouldn't use this one in the kitchen. Um, and here uh, we just have like upper cabinets are where a lot of folks um, use step stools in the kitchen. I've heard people tell me they climb on garbage cans. Um, they open their cabinet doors and climb on the shelves in the lower cabinets to get to rest on the countertop. Um, so dangerous. Get a good sturdy step stool. 
Um, don't store stuff you use often on the bottom shelf, on the top shelves, put those on the bottom shelves. Um, here we have a pull down unit that pulls your upper cabinet down to you. This is a more expensive product. It's about 220 to 250 from a company called Rev A Shelf. Um, Ikea makes some pull out items for the upper cabinets. Um, this is the only one I've seen that comes down to you. Um, I'm sure it's gonna become more trendy and popular because it's, it's a really cool product. Um, so if you are someone who really relies on that upper cabinet storage, thinking about something like this to bring that stuff down to you. Bathroom safety. Um, make sure that your hot water heater is set to the anti scald temperature of 120 degrees or lower. If you have any exposed pipes, like here we have open space under the sink for a chair to pull up underneath. Um, so make sure um, that these are um, not too hot and they do have some insulation around them. So here's how he, he uses the sink. Oh, here we have another example um, for this uh, bathroom. These doors actually can come and close shut so they can use it for storage until they want to have that space to sit underneath there. Um, this isn't really having to do with home emergencies, but um, remember that um, you can sit under a table or under a countertop in a traditional chair. It doesn't have to be a wheelchair. So if doing the dishes starts to strain your back, think about having an open space under your kitchen sink that you could sit at a chair or um, by your bathroom vanity. And here we have a uh, bathroom door swinging out. Um, that's a really crucial safety feature. If your hallway uh, allows it, if you have enough space for it, I highly recommend having your bathroom door swing out. Most door frames would be amenable to that change. Um, and it would be a pretty, a very doable um, Saturday afternoon, do it together project. You do want a buddy for that. Um, and the reason why we want that door to swing out is first of all, it gives you more space inside the bathroom. So if you were to fall inside the bathroom, you have a little bit more room to fall safely. Um, the other advantage too, is that if you fall inside the bathroom and so I fall and the door swings in, that fire department coming to rescue me is gonna hit me with the door. But if the door swings out, they're able to open that door and come and rescue me inside the bathroom. Um, so that's really helpful having that door swing out. Um, so here, here's how that would look on the inside. Um, again, I totally understand and acknowledge that in smaller spaces, um, narrower hallways, that might not be an option for you. Um, if you do want to have that feature though, there are other options to think about would be like a barn door, uh, putting in a pocket door. Um, we talked to one, um, one woman in Lakewood, we did an aging in place series several years back. And what she did for her bathroom, and this was her master bathroom, is they basically installed like saloon doors. So two, two doors that could open out that kind of Wild West saloon style. Um, that would be an option. Uh, a sh um, taking down the door altogether and putting up a curtain, that would work as well. Um, we've seen people do that in the master bathroom too. Um, so there are other options besides having a traditional door that swings out if that doesn't work for your home. Okay. Uh, questions on this last section or just in general? Hey Beth, I don't know if you know this, uh, but do you know what the time frame is on a fire extinguisher in terms of how long it stays good? I think they're, I, th I think they're five mm. years. Okay, I I'm not sure. Um, that probably sounds about right, and I'll. Um, I think Mara's because I have one. Right now. There's one that I have in my kitchen. I lived in my house ten years. It's behind the kitchen door. I think it's probably expired and flat and doesn't work, but it still sits there. Why you ask, I don't know. But this has been the kick in the pants that I need to get a new fire extinguisher uh, to keep us safe. 
USPS.org, which is apparently the United States um, Power Squadrons, says, I'm not sure what that is, so I'm not sure how reliable that information is, says that there should be an expiration date on your fire extinguisher and that most last between five to 15 years. So you should, if you have one, you, there should be a date on it that should tell you when to replace it. And Allison, if you do need to replace your fire extinguisher, that would be a good time. Take your old one and practice uh, with that. Um, that would be a good opportunity. What else? Other thoughts, questions? That certainly sounds like a good opportunity to me. Uh, well, I, you know, I'll tell you, and I think as Allison's working on getting some of the some other questions together, um, the looking at the um, at our at our small spaces at the Revis Shelf uh, website, they're really, I mean, as we start thinking about how can we be more organized to maximize our space, uh, but then also make things more accessible. I mean, I've got a small, narrow little, you know, cabinet, and for you throw all the pans and the all sorts of stuff and it's a big giant mess and so as you try to get organized i think it's fantastic and we do put our kids on the dining room table however it's not over the stove so at least that's good uh but it is helping you know to make cookies on the counter and so sure. i'll tell you this has really made me think about needing to set up a lot of uh better safeguards i do have a question also about about the fire extinguishers number one can you get them recharged because i do look at mine throughout the house and i have i have them all over the place can you get them recharged or do you have to get rid of them eventually? And then number two, what's the difference between the A, B, and the C? Because I have one in the garage that I bought specific for a garage and it's rated what, I don't remember what number or what letter, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the difference there? What does that mean? Okay, so first of all, um, and I will say that um, we are not experts on the specific fire extinguisher topic. Sure. Um, so from our understanding, um, like a fire extinguisher, there are fire extinguisher repair companies, um, like security companies that um, do, um, you know, the ones who check on like the health of um, smoke alarms and fire extinguishers, um, they can uh, recharge those uh, and do check on them. So like uh, apartment buildings have someone who comes by every year and checks the health of the fire extinguishers and replaces those out. Um, uh, Dave, uh, one of our uh, participants today, Dave said that the Avon Fire Prevention Department um, said not to bother recharging them as the price wasn't worth it. Um, and they advised him to shake the fire extinguisher occasionally so they don't freeze up. Um, so and that be fun. Yeah, so Nancy, uh, you can take your expired fire extinguisher up to the refuse department on Berea Road, so our dump, the Lakewood dump, uh, and they will help you properly dispose of them. Do not put anything like that in your garbage can. They can explode. Um, so by taking it to the refuse, like, cause when they crush the garbage, all the pressure that they would put on it, someone actually got hurt on the, um, refuse department because someone put a canister, uh, in their trash and it exploded. So, um, if you take it up to Berea road, um, they'll help you properly dispose of it. Okay. So, uh, the question about the uh, ABC fire uh, extinguisher ratings. Um, so those are different classes of rating. Um, class A's, and again, I'm, I'm reading this from the internet. Um, this is from the Nationwide's website. So I'm gonna assume that the insurance company uh, is going to advise us properly. Um, class A fire extinguishers will put out fires in ordinary combustibles such as wood and paper. Class B are for use on flammable liquids like grease, gasoline, and oil. Um, class C are suitable for use on electrically energized fires. And class D are designed for use on flammable metals. Um, so you can get the multi-purpose extinguishers like the ones we're talking about. Um, those will be rated for different types of fires. Um, the ABC rating that we recommended would cover 
um, what's going to happen in your kitchen. Um, so that's why we would uh, recommend that more well-rounded fire extinguisher um, for your kitchen. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and Dave also mentioned uh, to test them. The fire department suggested testing them every so often uh, and noted that they do have an empty and full gauge as well. Um, thank you so much, Dave, for your uh, knowledge sharing that with us. Yeah, Dave, Dave's always so helpful. Thanks, Dave. Mine, the gauge is like faded. You can't even see it. It's probably like 40 years old. So uh, number one thing on my shopping list uh, will be to have one. We do have a really new, a new one at the toolbox. That's protected. My own personal home, not, but the Lakewood toolbox is protected. So they do sell them at Lakewood Hardware. Um, so, oh, yes, and <laughs> yes, sorry. Yes, thank you uh, to Dave and Sandy. Sandy, too, you're amazing, and we appreciate your help, too. Hi, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, well, um, your presentation has been amazing and has really, my notes, I have a lot of notes here uh, and tons of things that I'll be working on. And uh, we, as always, just want to say thank you so much uh, to uh, Beth and Mara. We love working with you and we appreciate your insight and knowledge and your uh, wonderful dispositions. You guys have great senses of humor. Uh, so thank you. And uh, thanks to Ian for all this help tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, our next workshop is Saturday, uh, May 15th. We are partnering with Cleveland Lumber to put on a workshop about uh, making the most of our outdoor spaces. So there'll be a little bit of interior design, colors, how to freshen up our outdoor spaces, as well as um, some insight into front porches and back decks. Um, so we're gonna you know, do all that we can because this summer I think everyone's gonna be living out on their outdoor spaces. So please join us. You can find more information on our website, lakewoodalive.org slash knowing your home. And again, I want to thank our panelists, Mara and Beth, and all of you for spending your evening with us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you.